this is our opening thought tonight, which is Psalm 22. And I'm reading from the contemporary English Bible. So if it sounds a little different than what you're used to, that's probably the reason why. My God, my God, why have you left me all alone? Why are you so, so far from saving me, so far from my anguished groans? My God, I cry out during the day, but you do not answer. Even at nighttime, I do not stop. You are the Holy One enthroned. You are Israel's praise. Our ancestors trusted you. They trusted you and you rescued them. They cried out to you and they were saved. They trusted you and they weren't ashamed. But I am just a worm less than human, insulted by one person and despised by another. All who see me make fun of me. They gape and they shake their heads. He committed himself to the Lord, so let God rescue him. Let, let God deliver him, because God likes him so much. But you are the one who pulled me from the womb, placing me safely at my mother's breast. I was thrown on you from birth, and you've been my God since I was in my mother's womb. Please do not be far from me, because trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, mighty bulls from Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths at, at me like a lion ripping and roaring. I'm poured out like water. All my bones have fallen apart. My heart is like wax and it melts inside me. My strength is dried up like a piece of broken pottery. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You've set me down in the dirt, dirt of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of evil people circle me like a lion. Oh, my poor hands and feet. I can count all my bones. Meanwhile, they are just, meanwhile, they just stare at me, watching me. They divvy up my garments among themselves and they cast my, and they cast lots for my clothes. But you, Lord, do not be far away. You are my strength. Come quick and help me. Deliver me from the sword. Deliver my mouth, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. From the horns of the wild oxen, you have answered me. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the very center of the congregation. All who are all of you who revere the Lord, praise him. All of you who are Jacob's descendants, honor him. All of you who are all all of you who are all of Israel's offspring stand in awe of him because he did not despise or detest the suffering of the one who suffered. He did not hide his face from me. No, he listened when I cried out for help. I offer praise in the great congregation because of you. I will fulfill my promises in the presence of those who honor God. Let all of those who suffer eat and be full. Let all who seek the Lord praise him. I pray your hearts live forever. Every part of the earth will remember and come back to the Lord. Every family, family among all the nations will worship you. Because the right to rule belongs to the Lord. He rules all nations. Indeed, all the earth's powerful will worship him. And all who are descended to the dust will kneel before him. My being also lives for him. Future descendants will serve him. Generations to come will be told about my Lord. They will proclaim God's righteousness to those not yet born, telling them what God has done. So that very long psalm is Psalm 22. And then you should know that Psalm 22 and Psalm 23, the very infamous, beloved Psalm 23, is actually a couplet to Psalm 22. So they're supposed to be read together. So, so the opening lines of Psalm 22 is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the opening lines of Psalm 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Those are the flip side of the same coin of faith for the Jewish people. And, and really kind of if, if you just know those two things about Jewish theology through those two lines from those two Psalms, you can kind of sum up Jewish, ancient Jewish theology in those two lines. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
and the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. They're, they they are meant meant to be read in tandem and to be in conversation with each other. Um, and so um, Psalm 23 is almost the answer to Psalm 22 um, or you know, the, 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 the cousin or the, or the sibling to Psalm 22. So um, I wanted to read that for you because hopefully as you've read through the passion narrative, some of the lines from Psalm 22 have jumped out at you. Like, oh, I'm insulted by one person and despised by another. All who see me make fun of me. They gape and they make their, and they shake their heads saying, he committed himself to, to the Lord, so let God rescue him. Let God deliver him. Um, so that's so that's one. Hopefully, you hear the echo of the the taunting of Jesus on the cross um, by the Roman soldiers. Um, with, with that, um, there is the uh, they divvied up my garments among themselves. They cast lots for my clothes. That's a, a prior to Jesus' crucifixion. There's that scene that that takes place during the Passion. Um, obviously, Jesus cries out, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Uh, does so in a in a in a a mere a, a weird mix of of Aramaic and Hebrew. Uh, both languages are 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 are, are present in Eli Eli's. Um, Lekma Sakbethani. Um, that's a mixture of, of both uh, Aramaic and Hebrew. So Jesus in his pain and his torment uh, is kind of cycling through, you know, lots of different languages. It's a non-comedic version of like what Ricky Ricardo used to do when he got upset, right? And like, I love Lucy. Whenever he got upset with Lucy, he would do he would he would switch back and forth between English and Spanish whenever he was you know he got really agitated. Jesus is kind of doing the same thing. It's not again, it's not a funny scene, but it's the same thing. Like people who are bilingual will sometimes like when they're upset or agitated or frustrated, they'll switch back and forth between both languages, and that's kind of what Jesus is doing on the cross. He's got a, a, a Hebrew and Aramaic thing going on in that line. And it just speaks to his torment, right? That he's uh, his mind is all over the place in that moment, uh, and and through fear, through pain, through everything that's going on in him, and so he's he's bouncing back and forth between two languages that he's that he's fluent in. Um, so there's a lot, you know, there's a lot in Psalm 22 that is present in the passion narrative, and. One of the things that you should be aware of is that for the early Christian church, um, the Psalms became prophetic. So for the for the early Christian church, um, the Psalms became uh, prophetic literature for them. So when they read the Psalms, they read Jesus's life into the Psalms and that the Psalms were pointing towards Jesus and, and, um, and they found meaning, excuse me, they found meaning in particularly the events of the, the passion um, through reading the Psalms. And so I just wanna read off starting in chapter 14, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine allusions to the different psalms. And, I'm, and, I'll, and I'll just read these off for you. It's, uh, if you want to write them down, you can, uh, but, um, but I'm just going to read these off for you. You can come back to the video and, and find the list again, but I'll be very, I'll, uh, but I'll let you, um, but I want to let you know where these come from. So in uh, Mark 14, 1, there is an allusion to Psalm 10, verse 7 and 8. In Mark 14, 18, there is an allusion to Psalm 41, 9. In 
Mark 14, 57, there is a allusion to Psalm 27, 12, verse 12. In, in Mark 14, 61 and 15, 15, there is an allusion to Psalm 38, verses 13 through 14. I know I'm going a little fast, but I just want you to hear all of these different things. And then I just read through so much of Psalm 22. Oh, I'm sorry, 15, uh, 1534 uh, is, obvi is, is obviously uh, Psalm 22, 1. Uh, 1532 is Psalm 22, 6. 1530 to 31 is Psalm 22, 8. Mark 1529 is Psalm 22, 7. And Mark 1524 is Psalm 22, 18. And then the last one, uh, Mark 1536, there's an allusion to that in Psalm 69, uh, verse 21. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten allusions to different Psalms, Psalm 22 being the most prevalent one, but there are, there are allusions to the Psalms, and they found meaning in the Psalms, and when they when the early church was um, wrestling with the, with the events of the passion and the crucifixion of Jesus, they found meaning in the Psalms and they looked to them as prophetic literature, which is very different from what the ancient Jewish tradition, and, and that for that matter, the current, the, the, the contemporary Jewish tradition does with the Psalms. The Psalms for, um, our Jewish ancestors and our Jewish kindred, the Psalms are prayers. They're not, they're not prophetic literature. But for Christianity, the Psalms have been utilized as prophetic literature pointing to Jesus. And so that's a slight different way of looking at the book of Psalms than our, our, our ancestors uh, utilized it, and it's nowhere more prevalent than in the in the the passion narrative. So as you're reading through the passion, um, imagine being one of those early church um, one of those early church followers. Um, maybe you were a Jewish Christian uh, convert, and you're reading, and you know you're reading the gospel. And you're just seeing and remembering so many allusions to all of these events in the book of the Psalms. And, um, and so I just, I just wanted you to be aware of that, um, that, uh, that there's, a, there's a big correlation between the two. Any questions about that? Any comments about that? You can look that up at, on, on your own time where the different things kind of match up. The other, um, the other, uh, prophetic literature that is very prevalent in the Gospel of Mark at the near the end is there's all sorts of allusions to the suffering servant in the prophecy of Isaiah. Um, and so particularly Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53, um, if you read those two chapters of the prophecy of Isaiah and then read the, then read the passion narrative, particularly um, chapters 14 and 15, you can see a lot of parallels between the, the suffering servant in Israel and uh, the events of Jesus' crucifixion. Um, and the early church found a great deal of meaning um, in the suffering servant of Isaiah as a way to explain why, um, why Jesus had to suffer and die. Because that is the big question in early Christianity. If Jesus is the Messiah, why, why did he, why did he die? Why did, why, why did it not look like he won? Um, why does it look like he didn't free us from Roman oppression and 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 everything? And so, 
the early church had to ask that question over and over and over again. And they found one of the most initial readings or, or, or ways of answering that question was looking at the Psalms and looking at uh, the suffering servant in Isaiah. Diane, you look like you're going to ask a question. I do. Um, at least among some friends I'm thinking of, that's still a big question. If God's in charge, why do I have to go through all this suffering? Why does she have to go through all this suffering? Right. You know, and so that that's still a, a big issue, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And um, the idea of suffering and why do we suffer? Uh, is it on purpose? Is God causing it? Uh, I don't know if Vic told you, but like that was our whole kind of men's discussion group kind of conversation. No, the last no. two weeks. So um, and we didn't solve it. I mean, by any means, like two, I know that's going to shock you that, you know, yeah. two, two hours of, 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 of us in a circle talking about suffering, we didn't figure out why everybody suffers so much, but, um, but yeah, that, and, and, and finding meaning in suffering. What I will say this, one of my best, one of my favorite ways of, of, of thinking about suffering is, is, uh, Thomas Merton's, um, uh, claim that um, Thomas Merton's claim that God does not cause suffering, but nor does God uh, prevent us from suffering. Yeah. But God helps us find meaning in suffering. Yeah. And yeah. and persevere through suffering, mm -hmm. and that each time that we suffer. It is an opportunity to have our hearts softened so we are empathetic towards others who are suffering, or we can harden our hearts like Pharaoh and become cold to those who are suffering. Uh, and that's a Merton thing. That's not a big yeah. profound thing. That but I that's, know. to me, that's a really helpful thing. I, I just, I was writing as fast as you were talking, but, but one, I, I'm, um, I'm really focused on one of my friends, um, and what I what she and I talk about is when we're talking about the bad stuff, you know, God doesn't make the good stuff happen to you either. Right. You know, it's not like God has zapped you. This is my understanding. God doesn't hasn't zapped you for this wonderful thing. You know. I don't know. It's I I I think it's real hard for. Yeah, I love that. It I'd isn't love hard like, for me, you know, in terms of because it just, I don't know why it isn't hard for me. I think it's because of my faith that it's gone on for such a long time and I've struggled for such a long time. But I don't expect that God's, you know, God is finger you, yes, no, you don't get no. Right. Yes. Yeah, no, I know, I know. It, it, it's such a great topic. I'd love to talk about it more. Um, but I do think that's part of the power of the passion narrative is that God is present in our suffering with, through Christ, that, God is yeah. present in yeah. our suffering with us, right? That's and, why the Romans um, passage to me is so important. Yeah, right. You're so, never by yourself. Right, exactly. And so there is a, um, um, there is a, I can't remember his name. There's a theologian who once said, that the God of the universe knew everything except the human condition. And by, by being becoming incarnate in Christ Jesus, God finally figured out and, and, and went through the process of what it really truly means to be human. And so uh, by doing that, um, now God has a great deal of empathy for the, for humanity and what we go through, mm -hmm. um, that the God, the all knowing God knew everything except for what it means to be a human. And once G once God was incarnated in, in Christ, I can't remember the name of the theologian, but I, I was very taken by that idea that, yeah, uh, yeah. If, that, uh, if you find that, let me know. I will. So I want to very quickly go through 13. I'm just going to do a very quick overview. Um, it, is mo it, is, it is the most apocalyptic of Mark's chapters in all of the gospel. And I don't want to get weighed down in it because this is what I want you to take away 
whenever you read an apocalypse, a, a biblical apocalypse, I want you to first thing in your head is to say to yourself, this is not a prediction. This is an apocalypse. It's not a prediction, meaning that apocalyptic literature is by its nature metaphorical and allegorical in nature. Me meaning there is revelation is not a prediction on how the world is going to end. It is a metaphorical allegory to the, the, the quote unquote end times. The book of Daniel is not a prediction on how the world is going to end. It is metaphorical, allegorical language to that. And Jesus being steeped in Jewish apocalyptic uh, literature and knows exactly what he's doing when he gives an apocalyptic passage in, in, that we find in the Gospel of Mark. And so uh, what is the most important thing about an apocalypse is the end, because ultimately apocalyptic literature is hopeful. We get bogged down in the details of the scary stuff because the scary stuff makes really good, like, you know, movies and books and novels and sci-fi literature and everything. But what we forget is the actual point of revelation is not the seven seals. It's not the battle between, between, you know, the dragon and God. It's not, you know, it's not the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's not the point. The point actually is chapter 21 of Revelation, which is God decides to dwell with humanity forever in a reconstituted paradise. Revelation is using metaphorical language to provide comfort for those who are going through persecution. And Jesus here is using metaphorical, allegorical language about the temple being destroyed to ultimately provide hope for first century Jews and then later second and third, fourth century Christians that their persecution will come to an end. And ultimately, chapter 13, verse 26 is the whole point of the apocalypse. It's not the destruction of the temple it's not, that's not the point that just gets you to the point. The point of it is all summed up in this very hopeful message that then after all of this horrible crap has happened, then they will see the son of man come in the clouds with great power and glory, and it will be over. That's the whole point of the apocalypse is it's uh, so whenever you read Revelation, Whenever you read the book of Daniel, whenever you read um, uh, any of these apocalyptic uh, literatures, I want you to fir first thing to do is go like, all right, I'm reading metaphor. Because the writer knew they were writing in metaphor. I'm not doing anything. I'm not doing anything heretical here. I'm like the, the, the writer knew they were writing in metaphor and allegory allegory and but the point was hope. It's always hope at the end of an apocalypse that that God prevails over evil, that God prevails over violence, that God prevails over war, whatever it is. So does that make sense? I mean, I, I mean, Revelation is so fun to read. There's so much cool stuff in it. But really, the whole point is chapter 21. I mean, it's just really to get you there that we'll go down to this, we'll go down to the riverside and we won't study war no more, right? That's really the point of, of revelation. And all our evangelical friends who are really wrapped up in like, you know, is, is this happening or is that happening? Is this the end times? Like, that's not the point. The point is ultimately that God prevails over evil and just and, 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 and violence and war and everything. Okay. That's all I wanted to say about chapter 13. Let's go on to the crucifixion, which is um, chapter 14 and 15. So um, at the beginning of chapter 14, verse 1, I had you all write this down last time. 
we begin Wednesday. So the Passover begins at sundown on Friday. And if you jump ahead all the way to the end of chapter 15, you'll recognize that, this, that, the, that the crucifixion is over by sundown on Friday. So they just make it in terms of um, the law as to it being, um, uh, being done on time. So a couple of different things here are, are going on. One, uh, the chief priests and the scribes, so this is the temple authorities, are looking for a stealthy way to uh, arrest and to uh, execute Jesus because they don't want there to be a riot. And I just want to read this to you. The three pilgrimage festivals of Passover, Shavuot, and, uh, and Sukkot all happen within weeks of each other. And they would bring large crowds into Jerusalem. Uh, and the Romans, consequently, paid a great deal of attention to these events. Passover was especially explosive because of its association with the Exodus story and God's liberation of the Jewish people under Pharaoh's rule. And so each year, the Roman governor, Pilate, would move thousands of troops into Jerusalem to prevent an uprising. Ten years prior to the events of the Gospels, there was an uprising. The Romans uh, did a, a, a severe sacrilege to the temple by putting the Roman eagle on the uh, entry gate to the temple and the Jewish people over the Passover festival and the Jewish people in Jerusalem revolted, killing hundreds. That's, that's, that's written down in, in, in Roman history. And so since that happened about 10 years prior to this, the Jesus's crucifixion. And so since then, Rome was like, that's not happening again. And so there are lots and lots and lots of, of, of Roman soldiers in Jerusalem to be peacekeepers. And the temple authorities, the chief priests and the scribes, one of their major concerns during the Passover festival was always for there not to be another riot. So that's just sort of the background of what's going on here. Notice that uh, chapter 14, verse 3, a couple of things, again, that sometimes don't jump out at this. One is he leaves Jerusalem and goes all the way back to Bethany, which is a good little hike. And while he's in Bethany, he doesn't hang out with his three best friends, uh, Mary, Martha, and, and Lazarus, but he goes into the home of Simon the leper. So Jesus now is ritual, ritualistically unclean. Do you know what I mean by that? Meaning due to Jewish purity laws, Jesus has uh, made himself impure and unclean due to the, the Jewish ritual of uh, uh, purity laws. So when he re-enters Jerusalem, He's unclean. And so by, I think when we think about Jesus, like, you know, the, the kind of traditional theology of like, he took on the sins of the world. Here is a, a literal narrative uh, aspect of us, of Jesus, like becoming unclean in, in this, in this situation. And so when he's crucified, he's never been purified. Um, and so that's, this is a, just a, a little tidbit that we never really kind of, kind of think about. So even to the end, Jesus is breaking taboo and crossing lines of, mm -hmm. of, of culture and society to create community. Because guess who else? Look at all the other people that are there that came, that became unclean with him. It's all the disciples. There's all, you know, these, all these unknown people in the house. 
like they've all sort of turned their back on the on the 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 legalism of their faith to sort of embrace this love ethic of Jesus, which I just think is beautiful. That's right at the end, right before he gets crucified. One of the last things he does is cross the cross that boundary one more time by going into the house of a leper, uh, which is just beautiful in my my eyes. Then another little tidbit, like a little Jeopardy nugget that I think is really kind of fun. Does anyone know where uh, nard ointment comes from and why it was so expensive? This is your little Jeopardy question. It comes from the Himalayas. So it traveled all the way from the Himalayas to the Middle East. How one of Jesus's followers got a hold of it, we have no idea. This is so when it said that this could be sold for three hundred denarii, which is an extraordinary amount of money. There's a reason why this particular ointment is so expensive. It actually came from the Himalayas, and um, which is just just mind boggling to me. It also means that like these these cultures traded with one another. Uh, we don't think of the fact that like Jesus's people knew that in that Persia and India and China existed, but they did. Uh, they, they, those, those were known countries uh, to, uh, to the, to the people in the Middle East. And, uh, and so these came, this came all the way from Tibet, which is kind of fun. So he's, so he's, he's anointed with Tibetan oil, uh, which is kind of fun. Notice who doesn't scold the woman. Who do we think always scolds the woman for breaking the breaking the ointment and, and anointing Jesus? Oh, y'all have all seen Jesus Christ Superstar. Who yells at her? Judas. We always think it's Judas who's yelling at her. Judas doesn't yell at her. <laughs> well, that's, some, that's something in the Gospel of John, Judas yells at her. But in all the other gospels, it's just some, it's just the crowd. It's just the other disciples get upset with her. Why are you doing? Like they're, but in only in John does it say it's only Judas. Everywhere else, it's everybody. It's it's all the disciples get kind of upset with her for doing it. Um, but but um the anointing has two kind of ironic twists. The first irony is what Jesus says, which is um, that she's anointing him for his burial. Um, so, so, so we have this uh, irony that uh, this sort of oil would normally have been used uh, after the person had died to prepare them for um, the, the, the funeral wrappings. Um, it was to kind of cleanse the body before it was wrapped and, and, and laid in a tomb. Um, so this idea that a living person is being anointed with this oil is a foreshadowing of what is about to happen. But also uh, anointing with oil is uh, literally how you become a, a messiah. So, uh, so she's also uh, all the... Uh, the messiahs of the Old Testament, all of the judges, the kings, uh, when they were anointed as messiahs, um, and they were they were anointed with oil by the prophet or by the priest. And so by her taking on the prophet's role of anointing Jesus, then she is, in a, an ironic way, anointing him as, as the messiah. And so we have two, these two foreshadows happening simultaneously with one act. Um, and so the faith of this woman um, is yet another example of the Gospel of Mark of outsiders recognizing who Jesus is implicitly and those who should recognize him as the Messiah, his disciples, the religious authorities, those people, the Pharisees. They don't recognize Jesus, uh, but those who are on the outside, the lepers, the, the sick, uh, gosh, you really want a lot of attention, Willow. 
um, the, the lepers, the sick, the, the women, the children, those who would be uh, marginalized by society, not given as much power or enfranchisement, they recognize Jesus for who he truly is. Um, and, and here's just one last example of that before the, the events of the crucifixion. So then if you go down to chapter 14, verse 12, how are we doing on time? Got 15 more minutes. Uh, chapter 14, uh, verse 12, then we reach Thursday, which is Passover Eve. And so everything else, uh, all the way through to chat, everything through the rest of chapter 14 takes place on, um, takes place on Thursday. So, um, we have the, uh, we have, we have the, the last supper. Uh, so if you want to jump ahead, oh, well, I, real quick, um, I, I will just say this, that uh, when Jesus rides in on a colt, um, again, that's that's another symbol of, of Jesus's um, riding in uh, and presenting messiahship in a way that is uh, different from what the the traditional understanding of, of sort of the warrior king messiah is and so we have this um non-violent uh you know and the way i presented it on good friday was almost farcical uh kind of parade that's sort of joyful and fun um but um um but but this is another fulfillment of prophecy of, of the Messiah sort of entering Jerusalem, not on a mighty stallion, but on a, a much more humble, um, you know, animal of, of, of burden. But I, what I'd really like to jump ahead to is chapter 14, verse 17. So when evening came, it says, so, so this is uh, Thursday, um, this is Thursday night, um, he came together with the disciples. They're, they're, they're celebrating the Passover meal together. And uh, Jesus gives the prediction that one of them is going to betray him. Now, we don't know why, how he found out, whether it's just a feeling, an inkling that he has, uh, whether that is, um, you know, just sort of insight or someone tipped him off. Hey, you you need to know Judas is about Judas has done something that you might want to know about. Uh, we don't really know how he knows, but he, he has an inkling that somebody is going to betray him. Um, and betrayal is 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 part of um, you know part of just you know part of the story. And what makes the story so powerful is this idea that that one of his closest companions betrays him. Um, but Notice that Judas is not exi exiled from the Lord's Supper or the communion or the Passover. Uh, even though Judas, even though Jesus has an inkling of who it is that's going to betray him, um, he does not ask Judas to leave or any of them to leave. Um, nor does he, nor does he make Peter leave. Um, he doesn't make Thomas leave. He doesn't make John and James who, you know, argued about who is going to be the, you know, the greatest of all the disciples. Um, Jesus does not um, exclude any of his disciples from participating in the Lord's Supper. There is no barrier to the Lord's, like of, of all the people who ought to, that we might justify saying, all right, the, the other 11 can participate in the Lord's Supper, but you, Judas, like you can't. I, I think most of us would say like, all right, that makes sense. But, but Jesus's compassion and his forgiveness is, uh, is such that he allows, he allows Judas to remain in the group and Judas has to self-select out. Jesus does not push Judas out. Um, Judas's um, leaving of the 12 is of his own accord. Jesus does not push him away. 
which I think is a good word for us, that if some people don't want to come to our church, then that's, that's all right. That's on them and that they can make that choice. But we shouldn't be putting up barriers from allowing people to join us around the communion table. I'm actually very happy. Like we're, we're rewriting the bylaws and our, and uh, you'll be getting a copy of these in October. So this is a little preview. Um, but it actually says that uh, in the bylaws, it says that we, we practice an open communion table, meaning that there's no, uh, after, there's no statement of faith that you have to adhere to to take communion. And then it does say that a re, uh, uh, an ordained clergy person does have to consecrate the elements. But once consecrated, anyone can serve communion. And those two things made me incredibly happy to, to read in the new bylaws. Um, that um, you don't have to be a deacon. You don't have to be an adult. You, you don't have to be confirmed. You don't have to do anything. In the, in the new bylaws, it says, any, once consecrated by an ordained clergy person, then anyone can serve it. And anyone can receive it, which I think is, I think is consistent with the Lord's Supper story, the Last Supper story in, um, in the Gospel of Mark. Um, Ju uh, even Judas, even Thomas the doubter, even Peter the denier, um, even, even James and John, the vain, like none of them, none of them get pushed away. Diane. I, I think it's, uh, I've never heard that point made before about, um, Jesus did not exclude anybody from that supper, even though he, you know, he we think he probably had a sense of who was implicated. That's really, that's a really big thing. Yeah, I think so too. The way we should behave. Yeah, I think, again, that those last examples before the crucifixion, Diane, I think sometimes yeah. we cross over them. Like, he's in a leper's home. He's in, you know, he's hanging, he's he's allowing a woman to touch him. Yeah. Like, like yeah. he's, uh, he doesn't deny anyone the communion tape. Those last examples, we sometimes jump from uh, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord all the way to, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in between those two events, there's still some really important things that go on that are important for our faith. Yep. You don't you don't just fly over from one to the next. Yeah, yep. thanks for saying so. Um, we, get the, we get the whole story of um, uh, Peter's denial next, but what, what I'd like to focus on are, are two little just tidbits just to kind of Again, one of those things just to kind of know about the story. Since we're not from Jerusalem, you might not know. Uh, you might not know a couple of these things. But then I want to really talk about his prayer because that, to me, this, the prayer in Gethsemane is so powerful. Um, but the Mount of Olives, so um, just northwest of, or or in the northwest quadrant of Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives. It is a, it's more of a hill than a mount, uh, to be honest. <laughs> it's not that, it's, it's not that big. Um, it might have been bigger back in Jesus's day. Today, it's, it's a steep incline. Uh, but uh, uh, the Mount of Olives is exactly what it sounds like. It is an olive orchard. It's an olive grove. Uh, an olive vineyard, if you will. And, um, and it's a hillside that was just covered with, with olive trees. Um, then Gethsemane is a part of, is a garden on that little hillside. And it is a working garden, meaning that there are, that is where they would take the olives off the trees they would bring them down to the garden, and then the, in the garden, the workers would press them. And so that's where they actually made the actual oil out of the olives. Um, and so you just might not be aware of that. So I thought that would be kind of fun, just again, a little Jeopardy knowledge um, that, um, that, that when Jesus gathers his disciples for the prayer in Gethsemane, 
they're surrounded by olive presses and stuff like that, just to give you a sense of it, right? You know, um, you know, their surroundings, just there's just that kind of thing. And so Jesus goes into this very, very powerful prayer. And uh, if you go to 1436, he says, Abba, Father, for you, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want, or not my will, but your will be done. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, Abba is Aramaic, not Hebrew. Um, it is it is often, you know, you, you, you sometimes it's said that it's uh, uh, Hebrew for daddy or papa. Uh, if you've heard that, uh, just get that out of your head. <laughs> that is not true. Whoever has told you that has read that somewhere and believed it. I don't know exactly where that started, but it's not even Hebrew. It's Aramaic, and it doesn't mean papa or daddy. It does mean father, though, but it's not a pet name like Papa or Daddy or Papa or something like that. It, it does translate to father, though. And for Jesus, the father metaphor for God does seem to be his preferred way to uh, express his relationship to God um, and that intimacy of father and child or father and son, um, that does seem to be his favorite um, metaphor for, for God is father. And you can find father language in the Hebrew Bible, but it does seem to be somewhat of a Jesus invention to refer to God so intimately as father. And it really does express that very powerful, intimate, uh, integral relationship that is familial in, in its bond, right? That's how close Jesus felt to God, that God was um, his loving parent, his loving father. Um, and it really is a beautiful metaphor. I wish it could come back just a little bit more. Uh, I understand why it's not been in vogue over, you know, particularly in progressive circles. I really do. I understand it. Um, and I'm a big champion of inclusive language. Um, but I do miss, I, I wish we would reclaim it a little bit because it really is, a, in my opinion, a beautiful metaphor for the relationship between Jesus and, and, and God, which is why when I, we pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, I still say our Father. Uh, you know, and, and, and stuff. So it's, it's my little nod to that in the worship service. I might not use, um, I might not use gendered uh, metaphors and, and pronouns for God in my sermon or anything or my prayers, but uh, in the Lord's prayer, I still keep, I still keep it the way that, that it is. And that's just me. Um, but I love this prayer from the aspect of, of Jesus being so vulnerable and just wanting, wanting the inevitable not to happen. And how many of us are aware, how many of us have prayed that prayer that the mechanisms of life have, you know, are, are, are moving and there's really nothing to stop them. But you, you sort of your last resort is just to sort of get on your knees and pray for God to to stop the mechanisms, and um, and I don't know. I find that to be. I find that our. Um, I find that Jesus, being that vulnerable and being that scared, is, um, is an important example for us. Um, that we can that that more than one thing can be true. We can still have a great deal of faith in uh, in in God and and have a great deal of trust, and yet at the same time pray, God, I wish this would change. Please make this change. I would really appreciate it if you would make this go away. Um, and so, but but that doesn't happen, right? The mechanisms don't stop, um, and instead you know, it moves, it moves from here. 
Any uh, comments or thoughts about that? I want to end with one last thing, and then we'll 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 finish up with the crucifixion and resurrection next week. Um, if there's no more comments, then I just want to end with this: Why did G G Why did Judas kiss Jesus? Anyone have any? There, I would say there's a pragmatic, and there is a um, there's a pragmatic, and there's a, a a more theological idea or biblical idea behind it. Yeah, Tim. Well, pragmatically, it was to identify him as the the man who claimed to be the Messiah. Yeah. Right. To the, to the Romans. Right. So we have to understand that this is a in a pre-social media, pre-photograph, pre-newspaper uh, culture, right? So there is not a picture of Jesus floating around out there. So if you sent guards, uh, police, to arrest Jesus, and they have no idea what he looks like, they can't arrest him. So, so that is exactly pragmatically, it is, um, it's a way for them, for Judas to identify the one that needs to be arrested. That's exactly right. Pragmatically, that's right. Theologically or um, culturally, uh, men in the Middle East, even in the, even in the first century, men in the M Middle East would often greet themselves by uh, much like in European culture today, like with kissing on the cheek. That was a very, um, um, and it was by doing that, it was a sign that in my presence, you, you are safe in my presence. And so the betrayal goes even deeper that by Judas kissing him, he's putting Jesus in a false sense of security because a kiss on the cheek would be a very intimate gesture of saying, I will do, I'm doing you no harm and you will do me no harm. And so the, the, the betrayal is even, it even goes that, that level deeper. Um, and um, to use that gesture when he could have just come in and said, that's the guy. You know, instead he comes up and he uses this gesture. Um, now I will I will uh, recommend to you. You may be aware uh, that a gospel according to Judas was found um, and translated a couple of years ago. I would say five to ten years ago. Uh, found earlier than that, but translated uh, about five to ten years ago and published. Um, it is a, a Gnostic gospel, if, you, if you're familiar with that name, the Gnostics. Um, it is, um, it's much older or much younger than the gospels where the gospels sort of age out between 65 and 98 uh, CE. Uh, the gospel of Judas, you know, is, is, is seen to be 250, 300 uh, CE. Um, but it makes a very, it makes a very compelling case for us to have at least a little bit of a heart of compassion for Judas, that for, if Judas doesn't do what Judas does, does, does the salvation plan of God through the cross ex and, and Jesus's crucifixion uh, uh, occur? That's the question that that gospel is asking. Uh, if, 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 if not for Judas, can God save the world through the cross? Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying I, I, I'm. I'm championing that thought. I'm just saying the question. Someone thought that question through, and wrote a whole gospel trying to answer it. Uh, so I just wanted you to be aware of that. That uh, Judas is not uh, is not reviled everywhere. Last thing, as you were reading the story uh, in for, the rest of uh, 14, 15, and 16. Uh, know that uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but uh, Pontius Pilate um, is a saint. Did y'all know that? Uh, Pontius Pilate uh, in the Coptic Orthodox Church, uh, Pontius Pilate is as was made a saint. Uh, the tradition is that he converted to Christianity about 10, 15 years after the events in our in our scripture. And uh, the Coptic Christians uh, uh, made him a saint in around the year 400 or something like that. So, Amazing. yeah, isn't it right? 
pretty interesting. All right, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. We'll finish up the Gospel of Mark next week. Take care.